Get ready! You're tuned in to Tea Time Unfiltered with your girl, Lovely T, bringing you the hottest trending topics on social media. Stay connected. Instagram.com slash Lovely Tea 2002. Hey, you guys. Welcome to another episode of Tea Time Unfiltered with your girl, Lovely T. Yeah! Tea Sippers, I have a special guest with me today in the house. Her name is B.L. Sherelle. B.L., go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Hey, Tea Sippers. This is B.L. What's popping with everybody? All right. So B.L. is one of um, my Discord members, and she's a subscriber. And she has always, like, came into our Zoom meetings and just always made a lot of really good points and, you know, just captivated us with her stories and, you know, just the things that she's been through in Philly. So I asked her to come onto the podcast so that we could just, you know, have a, a hour long chat about just things that are really going on that are affecting real people. And one of the things that I have noticed in not only Philly, but here in the Twin Cities and around the country is the uptick in violence. And I remember um, a few months ago, there was another woman who called in and was talking about all the violence that was just going on in Philly and how crazy it was getting. And a lot of people are saying that um, this is being tied to, you know, COVID-19. Um, there being more guns on the street because of because remember when COVID first hit, everybody ran to go get guns. Mm -hmm. So that's causing more guns on the street, which is escalating the violence. So I wanted to go here, here and just kind of play this video. It's a news clip and they're talking about the violence and the uptick of everything going on in Philly and how it is affecting a lot of people in a lot of communities. So let's go ahead and check this out and we're going to come back and talk about everything. Father shot and killed in front of his kids as they were leaving a dog park. Yesterday's string of shootings is just the latest example of a deadly trend. According to the police department, the number of homicide victims is up 34%. From this time last year, NBC 10 investigative reporter Mitch Blocker is live at police headquarters as officers prepare for the potential of yet another violent weekend. Jackie, the latest violence, that surge in violence from yesterday, now has the number of homicides in the city of Philadelphia to 289. We still have 133 days left in this year until New Year's Day 2021. Evidence of murder investigations are scattered around Philadelphia. Friday, fresh tape hung in front of Tiffany Eddy's house in West Philly. Thursday, her son came home to a body in the street. He came in, he said, Mom, there's somebody laying in the street. So that's what I hugged him and said, that's why I need you to be in here before it gets dark. Police say 29-year-old Will Mayett was shot and killed, leaving a dog park with his young kids around 8 p.m. That's traumatizing for them kids because I was told that when it did happen, they ran off. I don't know where they ran off to, if they were with someone else, but that's scary. Three hours later, police arrived at this North Philly gas station. Two men were shot here in the parking lot and both died. It's just no words to explain how messed up that is. People are heartless. Police tell us eight people were shot in 26 hours between midnight Thursday and 2 a.m. Friday. Longtime Philadelphians like Robert Benjamin say they've never seen such random violence in their hometown. I was born in the 60s. Even the gangs back then, there was a rule that kids are, are, are off bounds. Like these, they don't care. Who's outside? Why are they doing what they're doing? And it don't make any sense. Now, researchers are beginning to connect the increase in shootings with the increase in gun sales, all related to the pandemic. A study published just two days ago in the American Journal of Medicine found that one out of every 100 Americans will eventually be killed by a gun if the current death rate keeps going the way that it is. It's the latest from Philly Police Headquarters. I'm Mitch Blocker, NBC 10 News. All right. So you just heard that. So that is really scary, just all of the things that's been going on. Like I said, not just in Philly, but around the nation. But I know Philly has gotten real bad because Meek Mill has been out talking about the violence. On top of that, we had the, you guys had a lot of rioting due to that um, police shooting with the man that came at them with the knife. Uh -huh, Walter Wallace. Yeah, Walter Wallace. So, uh -huh. that, so a lot of things happen. So do you want to just kind of give us a backstory on what which people is causing the violence to rise so much, particularly in your city this year? Right. So I think by the time this airs, I want to say we have 498 murders for the year. 
mm-hmm. right now. So probably we'll probably hit 500 before the podcast comes out. And that is second in the nation behind Chicago. Um, and so there was a, there's a couple things. So one is definitely the pandemic when that PUA money hit everybody and their mom went to go purchase, you know, a firearm if they didn't have one. And, um, a lot of the people who didn't have them at the time was too broke to get them. And, um, now that they have them, basically they are very reckless. And the biggest difference between, you know, prior and now is a lot of women and a lot of children are getting murdered. Like I personally know two women this year, one was nine months pregnant who got killed, um, shot li- deliberately, like not, not accidental, nothing. Mm-hmm. I know two women who were shot in the head and killed um, this year. And, you know, so the rules are like a lot different. So I place the, well, there are no rules. Um, so I placed the pandemic um, number two. Number one is that there's a power struggle within my city in regards to the DA and the police um, force. So my DA, his name is Larry Krasner. He's very progressive. Mm -hmm. He wants to, um, you know, he doesn't believe in the old way. Back in the day, you lock people up and you charge them with every charge that could possibly, you could. And then whatever sticks is, you know, whatever sticks to the wall, that's what you could kind of might get convicted for. And then the rest of the charges go by the wayside. So that was how they was very effective in giving people a lot of time. So he's a very progressive um, DA, which is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. However, um, some of his practices is causing, you know, an uptick in violence because he's not taking the money that would have cost to house them and put them in resources to help them. He's just kind of letting them out. So, you know, people who may have like a kid got a kid shot someone in the head and instead of them charging this kid with attempted murder, they, they charge it with aggravated assault because the kid, the, the person, you know, didn't die and stuff like that. And then it's easier for the person to get back out on the street. And, you know, a lot of these um, people who are committing these crimes are already having, you know, previous violent histories. And the police and the police commissioner, um, a black woman named Danielle Outlaw, she's new. She just came from Portland, Oregon this year. Mm -hmm. Um, They have an issue with how the DA is um, calling the shots in regards to this. So let me ask you this. Let me ask mm-hmm. you that speaking on the DA. Do you feel like the pressure for him to be more lenient is because so many times it's people who do not live in the city who got the most to say? Because remember when Meek was going through his whole thing, and I know Jay-Z was pushing for like, you know, reform and saying this man's been on probation for so many years. This is not right. Just like here in the Twin Cities, we had a lot of people who are not from our city who don't have to live here talking about defunding the police, but they're not bringing any solutions. So right. Our crime really ran up here. So do you feel like some of that pressure is they don't want to look racist. They don't want to look like they're trying to just lock away black men and throw away the key. So now instead of charging somebody who shot somebody in the head with, you know, with murder first, first or second degree, now it's aggravated assault. So it don't look that bad. So do you feel like they're caving into that pressure? I, I think that, you know, Larry Krasner is, you know, listening to people like, like me, right? Because, you know, I work kind of in the social justice, criminal justice sector. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's not, once again, he's not putting the resources. Yeah, you can let people out or, or yeah, you know, you can, um, you know, not charge a person with every possible charge, but you have to have some type of um, resources for them on the other side. You just can't let them out and just release them to the world, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that his, his, you know, his progressive practices, um, some of them are to be appreciated and applauded, but we're not going to sit here and act like some of his pro- progressive agendas is not hurting the city and it's causing a resentment from the police. And that is what the police are kind of stepping back. Like, okay, this is what you got. Yeah. Almost like when Freddie Gray, what happened in Baltimore. If you remember mm-hmm. when Freddie Gray got killed, the, the police just kind of stopped doing their jobs and the murder rate spiked in Maryland. It's almost like the same thing. Um, a police officer got killed in Philly um, not that long ago. And when the police officer got killed, Larry Krasner tried to go to the hospital to go, you know, visit or whatever, pay his respects or whatever, say something to the family. And when he got to the hospital, all the whole police force turned their back on him did like on camera in front of the whole, all the news in front of the mm-hmm. whole city. And it was, uh, uh, you know, they wanted like everyone to know, like, we do not, we do not film. Like, you know, like we do not, um, 
like like him at all. So at this point, the police are like not really doing their job mm -hmm. at the same time. So now it's kind of wild, wild west because they have resentment towards, you know, the DA for how he's handling things. And know? I think that's kind of what happened in my city, too, is that resentment. Um, and I could say probably with police officers all over, because I mean, I hear from people who have family in the NYPD and they kind of have the same stance too. all this, you know, fuck the police, fuck the police. Okay, cool. Well, now we're about to fall back and y'all figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I was telling people that I, I was here, you know, I live in the city where everything kicked off with George Floyd, you know what I'm saying? Over in South Minneapolis, I've watched everything play out and you can't take the instances of a few officers and paint an entire police department or give them that whole, you know, give them your ass to kiss. Because when shit happens, who's the first people that y'all call? Mm -hmm. 911, the police. So when you're saying things like F the police and, you know, defund them and things like that. And I'm not saying we don't have the right to be upset. Don't get me wrong. But like you said, you can't just have, um, it has to be balanced. So we can't just say, okay, well, fine, we're going to do criminal reform and we're just not going to give these people a bunch of time, but then there's no resources, there's no counseling, there's no jobs, there's no, you know, there's nothing else. And that was my yeah. issue. That was my issue with the whole defund. Y'all are screaming defund. It sounds good in a hashtag, but what is going to replace that? How are we going to, you know, get these resources out to the people when they do need help? Where's the training going to come in? Nobody really has any answers. They just want to scream. So right. I think a lot of the police officers are frustrated because they feel like they're being, you know, put in the same category as the bad police officers and they're being mistreated because of that. So now they've kind of have an attitude like, oh, well. Right. You know? and, and, you know, T, like, mm -hmm. you know, I got shot by the cops. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, I don't fool with the cops at all. Right. Um, however, um, and I also think that if you do that, if you decide, all right, well, I'm gonna just turn my back because I don't like the way you guys are, you're still not doing your job to, right. to serve and honor and protect the, the citizens of that wherever you work, wherever you are. So you're still indeed falling into the bad batch, even with that action. Um, however, it's almost like, you know, everything is so pick a side these days, right? Yeah. That you can't, like the, the in, in the field in the field that I work in, you know, I work in the prisons, right? So people ask me all the time, do you wanna um, abolish prisons? And everyone that I know, literally, like my wife, all my friends, everyone, I my whole life is people that were in prison. That's just how it went for me. That's my story. None of us wanna abolish prisons. <laughs> we all think that prisons should be a thing. We don't think that everyone should go. We think that some people may belong in a mental institution, some people may belong here, rehab, whatever, we, but we don't believe that there shouldn't be prisons. And that made me question, well, if we don't believe that, the people who actually spent time in prison, who are who is the people that's suggesting that prisons should be abolished if it's not the people who were actually in prison? So some of these agendas you know, that a lot of liberals, um, I'll just say, because I work with a lot of them most times, mm -hmm. I give, I have to give the side out to what their agenda or what their, you know, thing is. Like, or, you know, because I'm not against- Some of them are agents of chaos, sis. Yes. That's what it boils down to, because how can, I've never been to prison. I've never even done a day in jail. You know what I'm saying? I know friends who have been, I don't think I'm built for that, right? So that's why I just keep my ass out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you you will be fine though, too. You will be fine. <laughs> but one thing is, if I've never even been, who am I to say that all prisons, you know, should be abolished? Right. And you've been and you see that no, some of these people need to be in here and get yes. them for a few years and then come out and do better. You yes. know, because even as, as horrible as it was for you, you know, when you end up going to prison and everything that happened, we can get into your backstory. I think even you going and doing that time, it made you a better person. It made you appreciate things and appreciate life and, and really take your, your story and what you went through to become the person that you are today. I remember when you first emailed me and one of the things that you said, you said that you felt bad because you felt like, you know, why are you here and Breonna Taylor isn't? Yeah, like I go through. Yeah, and I said, that's not for you to worry about mm -hmm. because your plan and your destiny is what God has for you. And mm -hmm. her plan and her blessing, what God has for her is what God has for her. And your story's not over. Mm -hmm. You're and I, in your prison sentence. Yeah, and I, oh. baby, let's go.
Hey, tea sippers. To listen to the rest of this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, Tuned In, or AnchorFM.com, which is a free podcasting site. Thank you guys so much for the support, and stay tuned for the next video.